God's word for us. Brian? This morning, I want you to go on a journey with me. I want you to take a step back in time and to walk with me on the streets of 19th century Germany. And as we're walking there, I want you to imagine that what we are trying to do is hear what people think about the topic of religion. If we had shown up in Germany just three centuries earlier during the 16th, uh, 16th century, religion would have been one of the main topics of discussion going on. But 300 years later in the 19th century, we find it very different. There is little discussion of religion. In fact, there's been a major shift, and the thinking people in Germany now don't think much of religion at all. They think it's irrelevant. You see, the reason they think that is because things have changed in the world, and new ways of thinking have entered the world. And the main way that 19th century Germans view the world is through one of two systems. They view it through rationalism, or they view it through moralism. Rationalism is the idea that all that matters is what we think, and that the only way that we can come to truth is through the rational use of our mind. Well, this presents some problems for religion. Because while religion is reasonable, it's not always rationalistic. In fact, religion leaves space for mystery, for things we may not understand. But this doesn't jive well with rationalism. For instance, if you think about it, faith is reasonable, but even within the religion of Christianity, we have things that rationalistically don't make sense. Key things, like the Trinity, that God is three and one, that he's three persons, one essence. The incarnation, that God took on flesh and came to earth and was fully God and fully man. Things like the virgin birth, that makes a lot of sense rationally, right? or any of the other miracles found in the Bible. So rationalists reject religion and see it as unimportant because they see it as false. The other group, the moralists, say this, what we think isn't all that matters, what we do and how we live is all that matters. But since religion isn't the only way to come to an understanding of morals or to come to a moral viewpoint, it's really unimportant and irrelevant as well. So if you were living in Germany in the early 19th century, how would you respond? Would you simply say, you know what, I think the moralists and rationalists are right, I must abandon this too. Would you sit there and you would say, you know what, I don't think they're right, but they're not going to understand what I'm saying, so I'm just not even going to try. Maybe you would pray for them. Or maybe you would say, I need to find a new way to explain the faith and to repackage what religion is. Those issues are the exact issues that a theologian and pastor named Friedrich Schleiermacher faced in the early 19th century. What did he do? His conclusion was that what he must do is to repackage the faith for his generation. And he needed to repackage it in a way that both the moralists and the rationalists wouldn't reject. In fact, he needed to package it in a way that they could both embrace. So Schleiermacher goes on to redefine what religion is. And he says, religion is not what we think. It's not what we do. Religion is a feeling. Now, you have to understand for Schleiermacher, that was a technical term. And the feeling that he's talking about is that it's this absolute dependence on God that we feel, that we have to realize we're absolute dependent on God. But that's all that religion is. It's not what we think. It's not what we do. It's simply how we feel. In fact, he in essence said, I agree that religion is despicable. It's not how we act. It's not what we do. It's just how we feel. And if you follow me, I will show you what religion was meant to be. I have a quote from his last work um, called On the Christian Faith, where he says this, speaking of what religion is. Do you say that you cannot accept miracles, revelation, inspiration? You are right. We are children no longer. The time for fairy tales has passed. Only cast off, as I do, faith in everything of that sort, 
and I will show you miracles and revelations and inspirations of quite another species. To me, everything that has an immediate relationship to the infinite, the universe is a miracle. And everything finite has such a relation, so far as I find in it, a token or indication of the infinite. As Schleiermacher begins to redefine the faith, what he says is we have to throw off these things. We can't believe in miracles. We can't believe in inspiration because we are no longer children. We are too sophisticated to believe in these things. It leaves us with the question, why would a pastor and theologian do such a thing? Was he simply just trying to co-opt the faith for his own purposes? Was, was, was he just agreeing with his culture that religion is bad and so he was just finding another way to do away with it? No. What Schleiermacher was actually trying to do was to save religion for his generation. He was trying to save God for his generation. He thought God needed him to step in and to save religion. The problem is, when we step in and we redefine religion like Schleiermacher did, we often turn it into something it was never meant to be. However, Schleiermacher's response really shouldn't shock us. He's not the first one to do this. In fact, we see the same thing occurring in the Bible. And this morning we want to look at that. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can use a Bible in the pew back. Um, and you can open that to page 1,111, 1111. As we begin this morning to look at another person who thought they needed to save the Savior. As we do, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning, and I thank you for the opportunity um, that we have to be here, the opportunity we have to be here and to open up your word and to hear from you this morning. And we pray that that is exactly what will happen, that you will speak to us through your word and through my feeble words, that you will keep me from saying anything untrue or ridiculous, and use my mouth to speak your truth for your honor and for your glory, and so that we might be changed. Pray these things through your Son and by your Spirit. Amen. Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look at a big chunk of this chapter, and we're going to start in verse 13. Verses 13 through, verses 17, or, uh, through verse 16 in this chapter contain two things. They contain two questions Jesus asks, and two answers the disciples give. So let's look at the first question, starting in verse 13. We see this. When Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They answered, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus begins by asking his disciples a question. This isn't an odd question. This is a question that's been being talked about and pondered. Because you see, as Jesus is teaching and as Jesus is performing miracles and as Jesus is doing his ministry, there's one thing that it causes you to have to ask. Who is this guy? And people are thinking about that. But this is the first time Jesus explicitly asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do people think I am? And they list off Four people. They list off John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or a group, one of the other prophets. That should strike us because when Jesus asks who people think he is, this is an overwhelmingly positive response. What the people are saying is this these group, well, let me say it this way these two, these, these people have two things in common. The first is this they're prophets. They're all prophets. And when people look at Jesus' ministry, they see something unique. They see that he's not just simply a teacher, that he's more. And so it's praise for Jesus and who he is. But there's a second and more stunning thing that this group of four people have in common. Did you see what it is? They're all dead. Stop and think about that for a minute. <laughs> he said, I think you're one they said, they think you're one of these people. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What they're saying is this. They believe you're a prophet who has died and come back because he's come back for a special purpose. He's come back to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. 
The people see you're unique. However, the people don't quite get it. They see Jesus as unique, but they don't quite see who he is. You know, the people had their opinion, and Jesus had to be pretty sure the disciples had an opinion too. The disciples had been following him, in many ways putting their lives at risk as tensions with the religious leaders of the time are growing. And so the disciples had to have sat down and wondered, are we following the right guy? Who is this that we're following? And come to a conclusion. So Jesus asked them a second question, in many ways a more important question. And we see that in the following verses, in verses 15 through 17, where he asked them this, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. The people didn't quite see it, but the disciples did. They got it right. They understood that Jesus wasn't just a prophet coming to prepare the way for the Messiah, that he was the actual Messiah, the long-awaited one who would come to set people free. In fact, when Peter responds this way, Jesus pours out and gushes praise on him. He says, blessed are you, Peter. And then he says this, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father. Something really unique and powerful happens here. And, and, and Jesus is highlighting it. God has revealed to the disciples that Jesus is Messiah. And when that was revealed, the disciples embraced it. And I want you to remember that because here God reveals the truth. Jesus is Messiah and the disciples embrace it. And why wouldn't they? I mean, this is huge news. Jesus isn't just some teacher. He is the long-waited-for Messiah. And not only that, but the disciples are following him. What they had suspected and longed to be true has been affirmed by Jesus. That's why the next words that we see, we'll look at from Jesus, would have been a little odd to the disciples. Skip down to verse 20. After he revealed he was the Messiah, he did this. Then he instructed the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. That's kind of a little bit of a bummer. I don't know about you, but if I'm the disciple waiting for Jesus to come, I believe Jesus is the Messiah, um, he reveals that he's the Messiah and that I'm following him, I want to let everyone know. I want to shout it from the rooftops. I want to make sure every single person knows. But Jesus tells them not to because they don't have enough information yet about what that means, and Jesus doesn't want it getting out. The disciples seem to obey their master's request. But then Jesus begins to teach them and tell them something even more odd, something that will make that last statement's oddity pale in comparison to what he's about to say. Let's look at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. God is continuing to reveal his plan for salvation to the disciples. He first reveals Jesus as Messiah. Now he reveals how Jesus is going to save and what he must do. He must suffer. He must die and he must be raised again. You know, Jesus has already in his ministry hinted at what was going to happen to him and his fate, but it's, it had always been ambiguous. It's not so here. Jesus is clear as to what is going to happen. In fact, the Greek word that's translated here, these things must happen, can also be translated and often is, it's necessary. What Jesus is saying is that there is no other option of how we will save. This is the plan that God has laid out for him. So Jesus, uh, so God revealed to the disciples that Jesus was Messiah. They embraced it. Now God reveals what the, what the Messiah must do through Jesus, that he must suffer and die 
and be killed and be raised again. Let's see how the disciples respond to this new revelation. Verse 22 through 23. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord, this must not happen to you. But he turned aside to Peter and said, get, me, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me because you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. From Jesus' response to Peter's response, you probably get the impression um, that he didn't answer so well. And your impression would be right. While Peter's motives may have been good, that he wanted the Messiah to reign, he completely misses the boat. In fact, the, the text says he took him aside and rebuked him. Um, it's, it's almost this. Peter and the disciples are talking. Jesus is teaching this. And, and Peter comes up and says, Jesus, come over here and, and let's chat for a minute. Let me talk with you because, because I've got to confront you on something. I need to rebuke you on something. And it's not good for me to do it in front of the other disciples. So he takes him aside and he begins to talk to him. And, and, and one of the things we have to see in this is how ludicrous this action is. He takes him aside and he, he had just said he's the Messiah. He's the one who God has chosen to come deliver his people. And when the Messiah tells him the God's plan, he says, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's not the way it should happen. Come over here, Jesus. He, in essence, says this to him, you know, I know you're the one who placed the stars in the sky and called them by name, but you don't understand what's going on here. I know you're the one who imagined the sun and gives source to its light, but you're in darkness on this issue. You see, there's no way in Peter's mind that the one that he just recognized as Messiah could be killed. It was completely unthinkable because, you see, the disciples, like the people of the day, were looking forward to the Messiah coming, but the way they pictured the Messiah coming was not as a suffering servant, but as a conquering king. They pictured him coming in and totally obliterating their enemies and setting things right for the nation Israel. As one commentator put it, it's this. Being the Messiah, the Messiah meant unadulterated glory. But a dead Savior? That makes no sense. A dead Savior? This isn't what we're looking for. A Savior who suffers and is even risen, rises again? This can't be. It's not marketable. What Peter really believes here is crazy. Peter thinks he needs to save the Savior. He thinks he needs to take the Savior aside and set him straight so that God can do what he wants. While Peter's motives may have been right, he's missing the big picture. Because the big picture is God doesn't just have a plan, or an, um, he doesn't just have a goal or an end game, and that game is bringing the Messiah to rule. God has a specific plan of how to do it. And in that plan, it's necessary that Jesus be, uh, suffer, be killed, and be raised. And when Peter says, um, this must not be, Lord, what he's saying is the plan that God has for you isn't good. I've got a better one. You know, that really may sound odd to us, but it probably shouldn't. We live that way a lot, I think. When God brings suffering into our life that we think is unthinkable, suffering into our life that, that we would never want, isn't our response often, God, this can't be for any good. God, there must be a better way. God, this is just not right. When a loved one we know suffers with a chronic disease and is taken from it, with it. When a friend of ours has a, has a daughter who is seven years old and has spent, over, spent about 500 days of her life in the hospital. When we send young men and women off to war and they don't come home, God, really? I think you messed up on this one. Surely there was a better way. Really, when we look at Peter's two responses to God's revelation, we must ask what the difference in his two responses were and why they were there. Really, the difference is Peter was looking for Messiah, and he wanted to embrace that. But the idea of a suffering 
Messiah was something that was difficult for him to embrace. It was unthinkable. And so, Peter, in his well-meaning attempt to save the Savior, is actually acting like another character we've already seen in the book of Matthew. He's acting like Satan. In fact, that's why Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. The temptation that Jesus is offering, or Peter is offering to Jesus, is the same as the temptation that Satan offered to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Look at Matthew chapter 4 on the screen, 8 through 10. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their grandeur, and he said to him, I will give you all of these things if you will throw yourself to the ground and worship me. What, what Satan is saying to him is this, you want to be king? You can have it all. You can be king, and you don't need to go to the cross for it to happen. Peter is saying the same exact thing. You are the Messiah, you can be the Messiah, and you don't have to go to the cross. God forbid, may it never be. Interestingly, Jesus responds to Peter much the same way that he responded to Satan. To Satan, he said, go away, Satan, for it is written, you are to worship the Lord your God and to serve him only. To Peter, he doesn't actually say, go away. And, and actually, this is one of my favorite, it's grown to be one of my favorite parts of this passage. Because to Satan, he just casts him aside. To Peter, he says something a little different. He says, get behind me. He says, you're in my way. You've become a stumbling block to me in the mission that God has given me. Get behind me. And I think the get behind me is very different from the go away. Because what Jesus is telling him is this. Go back to your rightful place. You are my disciple. Your job is to follow me, not to lead me. The great thing is we know... Peter does get behind him, and Peter continues to follow his Lord. In fact, it's the reason that he can later write in 1 Peter 3.18, these words, For Christ also died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Here is the danger that we have when we repackage our faith. God hasn't only given us the goal He's given us the plan of how he wants to accomplish those things. And when we begin to repackage them and change that message, we actually change the nature of the faith. And we say to God, you know what, God? You don't know what you're doing. You need me, as good as I am, to step in and save you. He says, I don't need you to save me, but I want you to follow me. In fact, Jesus wants to make sure his disciples... And everyone in earshot understands this. That's why he says this, these next words that he says that are very famous in verses 24 and 25. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus wants to make sure that not only Peter, who has taken him aside to tell him this, understands it, but he wants to make sure all of his disciples understand it. That what he calls us to do is to follow him, and what he calls us to do when he calls us to follow him is to walk where he walked, which is walking to his death. It's even more interesting if we were to look at the parallel passage in Mark, because Mark says that he told his disciples that, but not only his disciples, but the crowds as well. He turns to them and wants to make sure they understand that to be a follower of Christ means that we follow behind him, that we go where he goes, that we follow his plan and do what he has for us. The problem that Peter faced in this story and that Schleiermacher faced are similar. What God was saying didn't make sense to them. It didn't fit well into their opinion of how things should be worked out. It wasn't marketable to them, and it wasn't marketable to their culture. So they proposed other paths to get to the same goal. It's just those paths weren't God's paths, and they were dead wrong. You know, we live at an interesting time. We live in a time where there are major shifts going on in the way that people view things, and look at faith, and look at truth, and look at the world. Schleiermacher lived strongly within what we call modernity. 
and, and I'm sure you've all heard the term postmodern or postmodernity. We live in a time where we're moving out of modernity into whatever postmodernity is or will become. And in that time, people are going to look at their faith and at, the, at religion, and they're going to say, you know what? Religion is no longer marketable the way it once was, and so we must repackage it. But when we do that, we're in danger of making the same mistake that Schleiermacher and that Peter made. In fact, we live in a time where a lot of the biggest names you'll hear in Christianity are honestly attempting to do that same thing, to redefine it for the next generation. Our, God is, our, our job is not to redefine the faith. Our job is to be faithful to it. You know, it could be really easy for us to leave these ideas here and, and end our time together. Um, it could be easy for us to say, you know what, Peter Schleiermacher, um, these new guys, they messed up, but it's good to know that I'm not getting in Jesus' way. It's good to know that I'm r relating everything well the way it should be related. But are we? I want to give you one warning this morning as we conclude and a couple of things for you to chew on and think about. The warning is this. The warning is we must always be leery of marketing, especially Christian marketing. You see, what marketing does, and the goal of marketing is to take a big idea that has a lot of different facets in it and to boil it down into something real simple that's easy to grab on and is easy to digest. And something to create with that, something that sticks with us. In fact, if I was to ask you all this morning to sing me some jingles of commercials that are no longer on the air, you could do it. Why? Because it's good marketing. They've got something that's stuck in your head and they boiled it down. The problem is when we boil things down like that, we miss the full picture. And often we begin to speak inaccurately about things. How much more true is that when we're talking about a God who is unfathomable, unsearchable, and we try to boil him and his work down into a little slogan. The reality is this. The marketing of Schleiermacher to his culture remains with us today. In fact, I, you might wonder where, and I'll show you one of the places it exists. In fact, there's two ideas I hear a lot in Christianity where it still exists, and they kind of come together in one phrase. It's a phrase many of you have probably said. It's a phrase I've said. It's this phrase. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. Let me talk about that and take that apart for a minute, just in each case. Christianity is not a religion. It, what bugs me most when we say this is we say it with the utmost confidence that this has always been true, and this has always been true of the religion of Christianity, that it's not a religion. However, do you know that idea has only been around for about 100 years? Do you know that when the church fathers wrote about Christianity, they called it a religion? Did you know the Bible itself speaks of religion both positively and negatively in back-to-back -back verses? James 1, 26 and 27 say this, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Did you see it in there? In one place we have religion that's worthless in the end of verse 26, and then he starts in 27 with pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God. This actually shouldn't shock us. In fact, if we were to look up religion in a dictionary in Merriam-Webster's, do you know how religion is defined in one of the definitions? It's defined as the service and worship of God. Really? Christianity isn't about the service and worship of God? And what is it about? A feeling? If religion is always wrong, religion's a sin. And we could exchange the word religion in there for sin. Can you imagine God saying, pure and faultless sin in the sight of God our Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress? No, it makes no sense. Because the issue isn't religion, the issue is there's true religion and false religion. 
Another way I might be able to demonstrate it is this. Both in English and Greek, there's an idea that's linked with the word religion, and it's worship. Almost every definition of worship will have, of, of religion will have worship in it. And in the Greek, the word that's actually translated religion in James 1.26 and 127, in another passage is translated as, as worship. So would we say this? The Bible speaks um, of false worship. Yeah, it speaks a lot about it. It warns us against it. Does the Bible also speak of true worship? Yeah, it commands us to do it. The issue isn't worship because there's false worship. The issue is false worship. It's the same with religion. God does not hate religion despite what you see on websites and here on YouTube. God hates false religion. The second part is this. It's a relationship. Now I'm going to say something that's going to shock some of you because we can even use these terms. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a personal relationship with God. But do you know that phrase does not exist in Scripture? If you were to begin to look for the Bible describing what Christianity is and look for the words personal relationship with God, you wouldn't find them. If you were to look back in the history of Christianity, you wouldn't find them until about 100 years ago. Why? Because that's not all that Christianity is about. Christianity is not boiled down to your personal relationship with God. Christianity is based on a God who is relational and has a relationship with us. But it's not just me and God. It's just not my personal relationship with God. The reality is when we look at how the Bible speaks, the Bible never speaks of just me and God. The Bible speaks of me be, become, um, coming into Christ, being in Christ. The Bible speaks about me becoming a part of the family of God. The Bible speaks about God placing me in his community and being part of something much, much bigger than me and God, being a part of the bride of Christ and being a part of his church on this earth. It's not about a personal relationship with God solely. And I know we think this makes us different, that somehow this sets us apart from other religions, but the reality is Muslims and some Hindus and Mormons speak the same way about a personal relationship with some of their gods. So where is it we got these ideas? According to Robert Bella, it happened in the 19th century when morality and religion took refuge in human subjectivity, in feeling and sentiment. It happened with the thinking of Schleiermacher. We must be careful how we speak because when we seek to redefine Christianity outside of the realms of the way the Bible speaks about it, we continue to walk in the footsteps of Schleiermacher and not our Lord. Well, I know these phrases are well-meaning. They are misleading and do not match up with God's revealed truth. And like Peter, those using them, and when I've used them, I may have had the same goal as God, but I'm not walking in the same plan as God. The good news for us is this. Although we may have missed the boat on this issue, God's gracious. He doesn't say, get away from me. He says, get behind me where you're meant to be. Don't lead. Follow. I don't need you to save me, but I do want you to follow me. Let us follow him well. Let's close in prayer. Dear friend Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we had to come together today and see your word and see Peter and how he responds to your truth and to your revelation. And to even look into the past and see how other people have responded to your revelation, especially when it's something that's difficult for them to swallow, something that's not marketable to their culture, and how they can well-meaningly shift to change the message so that others will embrace it only leaving people embracing something that's not Christianity. God, we are not so foolish to think this is just a problem that others have, but we recognize that we could easily fall into these same traps. And God, we want to represent you well, and we want to speak well of you. So work in our hearts and our minds so that we can see the truth of who you are. Help us to bathe ourselves in Scripture so that we can use the terms and the words and the phrases that you use and not feel we need to create new ones to express who you are. Keep us from thinking we can save you and teach us to follow well.